today my, my topic is missing links missing links and what i want to do this morning is look at about nine biblical teachings or doctrines if you want to call them that which i believe are the foundation of the good news um i i, I don't know maybe when i go through this list of nine things you might find other things that you would like to add but I believe that these nine, well, I've been able to categorize them under nine headings. I believe that they are very important. And as a matter of fact, if I, I don't want to put it this way, but um, I would say that anybody who understands these nine things, I would say that you have a good understanding of the gospel. And I would say that if you if you are out of harmony or if your understanding is wrong on any one of these things, you you can't really appreciate the gospel and i believe that um god has given us an understanding those when i say us i mean those of us who are a part of this fellowship god has given us a good understanding of these nine things and um i would like us to focus on it this morning at the end i don't know if we'll have enough time for any little comments or questions but i'll try to finish in time that we can have even five minutes for a little uh, question and answer session because you might have other things that you would want to add to the list or you might wonder why is this not there but um i'm just going to go to my bible screen and just bring up those nine things and we we'll look at them so what i'm entitling the study this morning i'm entitling it missing links um okay there's something hiding the screen now we should be good okay there we are so i'm going to entitle the subject the, the the study this morning missing links and um as i said these are the, the 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 things that i consider to be the main doctrines the most important doctrines in terms of the christian faith um i'm not going to uh, not necessarily in this order but probably in this order the first one i want to to mention is the identity of god the identity of god that's the first one now what do we mean when we talk about the identity of god and why is this so important well most of us belong to this movement that we refer to as the one true god movement the one true god movement and um what we what we mean by this is that our belief concerning God is different from most people in the world because most people believe that God is, well, most Christians believe that God is a trinity. God is made up of three persons composed of one being, one being with three elements referred to as three persons. Others modify that a bit and they believe that God is three separate and distinct beings each one is god and all three together make up a kind of committee that is referred to as god there are still others who believe that there is only one individual one person one being but he has but at one time he appears as the father another time he manifests himself as a son and then another time he manifests himself as the holy spirit so all of these i consider to be some form of the the, the perverted concept of God now we believe that there is only one God who is the father there are two divine persons and there are let me say there, there, there are two ways in which God expresses himself if you say through his spirit you could say three ways himself and through his son and by means of his spirit but there are only there's only one God and this is a father this is this is the emphasis of the Bible and I believe that it is one of the foundational elements in terms of understanding the gospel and the important truths of the Bible. If you get this concept of God wrong, you are never going to be able to understand the, the, the gospel properly. You are never able uh, you are never going to be able to understand the character of God. And I'm not saying you cannot be a Christian because I believe there are Christians who hold to these perverted views but you can never become you can never understand and have the kind of relationship with god 
that God wants you to have. Because ultimately, as 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 I am fond of saying, you don't rule your beliefs. Your beliefs rule you. That is a fact of life. You cannot behave differently. You cannot you cannot relate to a person differently than what you believe. You know a person to be a, a cold hearted murderer, and the person comes and says, I'm really kind, I'm a nice person, and um, you know, I can be trusted. And you know this about the person. You might smile and say, Yes, I, I think I think so, I believe so. But in your heart, you won't believe it. And every time you get into a little conflict with this person, you feel a little worried, you feel uneasy because you know the true nature of this person. Your beliefs will rule you. You don't rule your beliefs. No matter what you say, I believe. No matter what your creed says, no matter what you tell yourself you believe, what you believe is what is in your heart and it will manifest itself in how you behave and how you relate to people. This is one of the reasons why for the past eight weeks, I have been emphasizing the kind of person God is and the kind of character he has and the kind of relationship he wants to have with us. I believe that this is the, the greatest fruit in all the universe, the truth about the kind of person God really is. But foundational to coming to that conclusion, you first of all have to understand the truth, the identity of God. You have to know who God is because who God is is related to the kind of character that God has. And as we look at the other points, you're going to see that this is this is true. So I'm going to skip back and forth because I'm mostly going to be focusing on some general ideas this morning, not so much on um, even going to the biblical statements, because you know the statements, all right? For example, when it comes to the identity of God, you know that um, we could you could use this verse, you know, on to, on 1 Corinthians 8. Let me actually look at the verses so I bring them up on the screen. 1 Corinthians 8, um, there are many of them. I'll just choose one as a point of reference. 1 Corinthians uh, 8, it says to us Christians, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we in him. So the Bible teaches us there's only one God. And it says there's also one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by him. You all are familiar with um, John 17 and verse 3, where Jesus says, and this is life eternal. This emphasizes how important it is to know, to know who God is and to know God. This is eternal life. This is what eternal life is wrapped up in, that they might know thee, the only true God. That's a part of the formula for eternal life. And Jesus Christ, whom thou, the only true God, has sent. So don't let anybody tell you that it's not, it's not worth discussing and it's not a significant point and it's making an issue out of nothing. If, God, if Jesus says that eternal life is related to the truth, that he is the only true God and knowing him, then nobody, nobody can be correct in saying it's an, a, an insignificant point. So this is number one that I have on my list, the identity of God. That's point number one. Now I will say that there are people, when you look at the spectrum, of Christendom, Christian beliefs. You find that, as I said, throughout most of Christendom, there is hardly anybody who understands this truth. But there has, has arisen a little group of believers, very small but growing, who have come to the, an awareness of this truth. And most of us refer to this movement as a one, one God movement or the one true God movement. What I find interesting is that there are individuals from other denominations, not just Adventism. There are individuals from other denominations that I find are stepping away from their churches and also embracing the same truth of the one true God. There are not many, but there are some. I've met them. And um, it shows me that God is doing something. Now, I pointed out, and I want to emphasize this point. I am not suggesting, none of us is suggesting that people cannot be saved who believe in a trinity. There are many Christians who believe in a trinity like I used to believe, and yet 
I believe that they have accepted Christ and they have received salvation. So what is the problem? Why, why is it necessary to understand this truth? Because the, the world will never be enlightened. Jesus will never come. The gospel will never be preached until the message, the true message of God's character and the righteousness of Christ until it goes to the world. It will never happen. God is not going to put an end to the controversy until the issues are settled. And the issues are to be settled when there comes a correct awareness of who God is, the kind of person God is. This is the, 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 the great truth that settles the great controversy. It's not going to finish without that. So even if it's, it's not about salvation, we have made that point, right? Most people think that they, the whole controversy is about who is savable. And how are you savable? That's not the issue. That may be your personal issue, but that's not the, the issue before the universe. The great question before the universe, raised up before earth was created, formulated and advanced by Lucifer, the great question was, what kind of person is God? That is the question. Rebellion arose in the universe because Lucifer distorted God's character. The sin of man, the sin of humanity was just uh, one extension of that rebellion. It was just a, 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 an opportunity to let the issues play out and let us see. It, was ju it just became a proving ground where these questions could be settled. But the great question is, what kind of person is the creator of the universe? And this question cannot be answered by people who believe in a trinity. You see what I'm saying? God's end time witnesses have to be people who understand the truth about God. So that's point number one. This is why this is, is such an important doctrine and why even though the world is full of Christians, Adventists, Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, Wesleyan, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, the world is full of Christians. But those who are fulfilling the will of God, particularly in the end of time, rising to higher places, with the Lord, they must understand the truth about God. All right, that leaves us feeling pretty good about ourselves. <laughs> I don't mean that, but that is a normal human response, all right? But I know that even within our movement, there are many divisions, many differences. And so we want to look at the other points. That's number one out of, I have nine, right? Like I said, maybe I missed something. Maybe I, uh, they overlap. But let us go to the next one and see. And see how we look at this one. The second one, I would say that before we come to number two, I have them in the wrong order here. I'm going to put um, number two as the sonship of Jesus Christ, the literal sonship of Jesus Christ. All right. So that is related, of course, to the the truth about the identity of God. Because if you don't understand the identity of God, you don't think Jesus is God's son. You can't. You can't accept that Jesus is God's son. You have to think that Jesus is God himself, but he's masquerading. He's pretending. He's acting a role. The first thing you have done, you have distorted, you have distorted God's character by making God out to be a pretender. Okay. God, God, one, of the, one of the things we know about God is that God is a God of truth. When you make God out to be, first of all, from the very beginning, in one of the most fundamental, important aspects of, Chris, of Christian experience, God is confusing you. As a matter of fact, I would almost say God is deceiving you because God says, he's my son. Jesus says, I'm his only begotten son. The Bible says God loved the world and sent his only begotten son into the world. And yet it is not true. You are fundamentally making God out to be a deceiver. And right away, you are distorting the character of God. One thing we know, brothers and sisters, when it comes to friendships, marriage, friendship, any, any, any relationship that is really special, one of the, 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 the elements, or, or I would say the key element, is always trust. I think you can agree with me. Where you find that? A husband stops trusting his wife. The wife stops trusting the husband. You stop having confidence in your friend. Instantly, 
the relationship starts to break down instantly. It is impossible for any relationship to flourish where you cannot trust a person. And, and the, the less transparent a person is, the more reason there is for this trust. One of the things that you know is fundamental to trust is that you open up yourself. I mean, on, on Friday night, I'm always encouraging everybody, turn on your camera. I'm encouraging everybody, let me hear your testimony. And you know why, right? Because you all know that as soon as somebody starts sharing their testimony, some of, uh, of the brethren are very open. They tell you the details of their lives. And those are the people that you start to get close to. Some of us, we only see a name on the screen. We never see, we don't even see a face. We don't know what the person looks like. We never hear the person speak. We never hear a voice. You almost seem to be visitors, people passing through. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not knocking you, but I'm kind of knocking you a little bit because um, you, 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 you learn to trust and you learn to be brothers and sisters and your friendship grows because the more you know about a person, the more transparent you are, the more people get to, to, to understand the way your mind works, the way you are, and the more they can feel confidence in your presence. From this perspective, I'm pretty glad that I'm the person who is most, is, I'm among the more open people, so you know everything about me. So, anyway, if, if God is the kind of person who makes statements that you cannot trust and you can't have any confidence in, God says, this is my son, but he's not my son. You, you, you leave me confused. And furthermore, this kind of misrepresentation of God is not only limited to where, where he says, Jesus is my son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. I love the world and gave my son. And yet he's not my son. How can I measure your love? How can I know your love? The greatest, the greatest expression of God's love in the universe. God himself says it. Jesus, his son, says it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, you can argue, you can go, people come and say, Jesus was not the son of God before he came to earth. They say, the Bible does not say this, the Bible does not say that. And I, 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 for me, I can cut across all the smoke and the mirrors, and I can simply say, what does God say is the greatest expression of his love? I mean, sometimes you can get past the arguments. You can argue and you can talk about Greek and Hebrew and you can debate about what this verse, the implications of this verse and the nuances of the Greek. Sometimes you just have to stop and think and stop getting into the confusion of these, these, these scholastic people because you just have to stop and think. God says, I love you. Okay, Father, I know you love me. How much do you love me? I love you so much I gave my son. What kind of son did you give? I loved you so much I gave my only begotten son. But you're not supposed to believe he's my son. Then my father, you just gave me a meaningless statement. In this, John says, in this was manifested the love of God. In this was manifested the love of God in that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. This is a statement where God says, I'm going to show you how much I love you. You can't appreciate or understand that love until you appreciate the value of the gift. Remember that. The measure of the love is the value of the gift. And when God, when God tried to express it, he, he either deceived us or he expressed it correctly. It's not metaphor. It's not simile. It's the truth. God loved us and he gave his only begotten son. This is something we can understand because we are human beings. We know what sonship means. We are, most of us are either daughters or sons and we have daughters or sons. We understand. So God tells us the truth of the kind of gift that he gave because he knows we can understand and appreciate what this means. So that's, 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 that's perhaps the the greatest expression of the truth of God's character. Sometimes when you ask yourself, 
What about all the people who die? What about all the children who die? What about all the suffering? What about the times when it seems like God does not answer prayer? Where is the love of God? And God says, you can't understand everything. But what I want you to understand is to look at my son and think about how much I love you. I love those who die. I love those who are suffering. I love those who are lost. How much, Father? I love so much that I gave the most precious thing that the God of the universe can ever possess. If you ask yourself, what, what, what can God give? What, can God, what, what value does anything have to God? He can create worlds. He can create universes. Okay, he can give you a universe. Okay, I love you so much, I give you a universe. How do, what does this mean, Father? I snapped my finger and I created it. What could God give? There is one thing that God could not snap his finger and create. There's one thing God, God, God could not create relationships, real relationships by just snapping his finger. Because real relationships depend on the, the response of somebody. God had somebody that had a relationship with him, special relationship, one of his own kind. As Adam said, blood of my blood, flesh of my flesh, God had one like this. That was something that the God of the universe could value. And he's saying, I loved you so much, I loved you so much, you little creature of dust, that this is what I gave for you. So someday we'll understand the hard questions, but in the meantime, we can look at the Son of God, we can look at the gift of love, and we can know God gave him to be a part of my race forever. God gave him to die for me, but more, God gave him to live for me, to be one of my family forever. I can measure the love of God and I can understand. So that's what I see as a second point, the second vital element of truth, the literal sonship of Christ. Point number three, I see. Point number three, the dual, the, the, the nature of spirit. Now, again, I will say that when it comes to understanding the sonship of Christ, again, you have a very limited little group of people, those in the one God movement, and they believe that um, Jesus is the literal son of God. But we come to point number three, the nature of spirit. Now, here we begin to have split up and division. Because in the one God movement, there are some people who don't, don't have anything to do with our ministry. There are some people who condemn our ministry because of what we believe about spirit. When it comes to the truth about what is spirit, the funny thing is that you do have some, you have some non-Adventists, you have some Sunday keeping Christians, you have some Trinitarian Christians who have some kind of understanding of what the spirit means when it refers to you as a human being. But when it comes to the spirit of God, they step away from logic and they make the spirit of God something entirely different. But according to the Bible, a person's spirit is a non-physical element of his being. That's the way I would put it. All of us are physical beings. But the true nature of each one of us is our spirit. There's a spirit inside of us which is truly me. And the Bible talks about it. James says, the, the body without the spirit is dead. Ecclesiastes says, when a man's, man dies, the dust returns to the earth and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Job says, there is a spirit in man and the spirit of, of the Almighty giveth him understanding. In Zechariah, it says, God forms the spirit of man within him. Paul says, when I'm present with you, I'm not present with you, but my spirit will be there. Paul speaks about a man and he says he hopes that the body might be destroyed, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Over and over in the Bible, there is a spirit. When you die, the body perishes, but the spirit is preserved to be put in another body and you come back to life. So this is the biblical concept of spirit. And honestly, when I was an Adventist, I never ever understood this. I never heard it because Adventists on the whole do not understand this. They believe that the spirit is simply breath. In the one God movement, I thought we would understand because we are understanding that the spirit of God is God's 
presence is God's person without God's bodily form. So I was very surprised when in the One God movement, they began to come against us for, for teaching that your spirit is a non-physical component and that the spirit of God is actually the presence of God. And they began to teach th these persons, many of them are teaching that the spirit of God is really the words that God speaks. They are teaching that the spirit of God is really the, 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 the characteristics of God. When you read the word and you begin to accept the word and you begin to behave like Christ, then they say you have the spirit or the attitude of Christ. They see spirit as referring merely to the attitude that you have. But we believe that the spirit of Christ is actually the presence of Christ and the Father, literally his presence, literally their presence, but not their bodily form, but their mind, their power, their wisdom, their strength and all the elements of personality, but without the physical presence, without the bodily presence. So this also is another important foundational truth. That's number three. David, can you repeat that again? Uh, so I was making a note and I missed out. Uh, the, the spirit of God is, can you explain that one more time, please? Thank you. I'll go back over it. I'm not going to, I'm, I don't think I'm going to be able to repeat the words because I don't remember the words I used. I was more focusing on no, the just concept. the meaning of it, just the meaning of it. Yeah, the spirit of God is the actual presence of God. And in this case, it's God and the son because both of them, have, uh, uh, their spirits are united. It's the presence of God and his son in all their power, their, their, their mind, their personality, everything that, composes personhood except the bodily form. So when we say that God is in our meeting, it's not just that the words of God are being spoken here, it's that his presence is here, his power is here. We can interact with him, we can speak to him, and if he were to choose, he could speak back to us through his spirit. And we don't mean the angels like some people are saying also. We know angels are here, but God is here. So this is Point number three in this list of vital things that we need to remember. The, the, Thank the, you, David. You're welcome, Brother Ray. Point number four, the dual nature of Christ. Again, this is one thing that um, I find that, I don't know. I don't know how to, how to describe it because you have you have some people outside who believe it you have some people inside who believe it and you have some people who the, the belief on this is very confusing but i think that when putting all the elements together i have not found it many places outside of our, our ministry i mean in everything that i'm saying i'm going to be very plain all right i think in many of these, in many of these things i feel very confident that um Revelation 14, verse 12, brothers Imad and Nadar, in many of these things, I'm very confident that they are in agreement with us, okay? Um, I, 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 I tend to be very plain and I, I, I don't want to go beat about the bush, but I'm not going to, I, I don't, maybe I wouldn't call names this morning, but most of the other ministries that are in the One God movement, they are either somewhat in disagreement are in very strong disagreement with us on some of these points. That is one of the reasons why there is such fracturing in the One God movement, because, I mean, it's very difficult to, to work with people when they have disagreements on fundamental truths. And these that I'm focusing on, I consider to be fundamental truths. All right? So the dual nature of Christ, and what do I mean by this? It's simple. When you understand what spirit is, it's easy to understand that Jesus, in Jesus, there was a divine spirit, while his body was an entirely human body. The Bible says that it, in all things, it, it, it behoved him to be, be made like unto his brethren. In John 1 and verse 14, it says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. 
But even though Jesus had a divine spirit, it, it says, we beheld his glory. What kind of glory? The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. In him was the glory that was never seen anywhere else. It could not be seen anywhere else in the universe because the glory in Jesus was the glory of the Son of God. Where else can you find that? The glory of the begotten Son of God. Where else can you find that? Not in the prophets, not in the priests, not in the great men, nowhere else but in the Son of God. And so the Bible says that the people who dwelt in darkness, what did they see? They saw a great light. And that great light was the light of the glory of the character of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. So Jesus was a divine being, and yet his body was not divine. His abilities were not divine. He could say, of mine own self, I can do nothing. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So what this teaches us is that Jesus had the, the character of God, but not the power of God. And his body was completely the body of a human being. He was limited like we are. He could not jump over tall buildings with a single bound. He could not fly through space. No, he could do nothing that you and I cannot do. He was a, he was a man. But he was a man with the character of God. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus was different. He was a man. He was a man who had the character of God. And that character was because in him was the spirit of the only begotten son of God. This is the truth. And when we understand this truth, it becomes vital to understanding the gospel and the plan of salvation. Those two elements, you can't understand the gospel without it. People say, Jesus died to save me from my sins. They don't know what they're talking about. People say Jesus overcame sin. They have no clue what it means. Because Christians don't understand the dual nature of Christ. It's very important to understand this. And you know, if we don't get to go into all the nuances of what that means today, I'm going to revisit this topic because every single one of these things is extremely important. The next thing is, of course, the truth of the two Adams. And I thank God for helping us to understand this because this was like a catalyst. It was like a, 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 a key that you put in a door and when, it, when you turned it, it opened the door and everything began to fall in place. Most Christians claim to believe in the two Adams. Well, maybe not most. Many are like me. I never, I never, I heard, of, I heard of it, but I didn't understand. But the thing about the two Adams is that most Christians, almost every Christian outside of our movement, they view the doctrine of the two Adams as simply legal jargon. What do I mean by this? What they mean is that Jesus, Adam committed a sin. And so all of the human race came under the condemnation of God. God condemned everybody. First of all, that makes me question God's character. You sin and God blames your child. You sin and God condemns your child. If this is God, if this is God's law and God's legality, there's something wrong with God's justice system. So that perspective is absolutely something we cannot accept. What happened was that it was not about legal law. It was about the principle of people choosing masters. You choose God or you choose Satan. Adam chose Satan's government and he took the human race because when Adam made this choice, you and I were in Adam. We were in the, in the body of Adam. None of us was born. We were in Adam. And when Adam stepped across to Satan's side, you stepped across inside of Adam. You were born in the kingdom and under the dominion of Satan. You were in Adam. That was liberating when I found this out. That was one of the greatest truths I ever discovered because, you know, before this, I beat myself up for my mistakes. I blamed myself for every failing. When I, when I discovered this, I was free because I knew, like the story I told of the rat the other morning, I knew that the rat came into my house and the rat was eating my, my stuff. Not because the rat was wicked, 
but just because he was a rat. Just because he was a rat. And he had to die because he was a rat in my house. But I, I, I could not kill the rat with animosity. I could not take revenge on the rat. Why do you take revenge on a rat for being a rat? Are you stupid? He's a rat. It's his nature. But because of the nature, you can't allow it to live. And I realize that this is what happened to the human race. We, we, we had to die because we were not fit to exist in a flawless universe. But we were not to blame. I was born this way. My failings were not my fault. Everybody made me think it was my fault. It was not my fault. The two Adams set me free. And when I discovered it was not my fault, some of my friends in the One God movement, they, 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 they were outraged that I should say, say a thing like this. But they didn't listen to hear that aside. They didn't listen to hear the other side. The other side is that God provided a different life, a second Adam, to set me free from the heritage of the first Adam. Isn't that marvelous? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, indeed. It's bad that Adam brought us into condemnation, but amazing that God found a way to bring us out of it, just like we were condemned without our input. We are redeemed without our input. Marvelous. The truth of the two Adams was one of the great blessings of my life. And everything came into place when I began to understand it. So this is fundamental to the gospel. And again, as I say, there is such a mixture of ideas where the two Adams are concerned. Some people think it's legal. Adam legally condemned us. God condemned us. And God says, I need somebody to pay the price for these people because they're all condemned. I condemn them. My law condemned them. I need to set them free. So somebody has to pay a price. I'm going to give my son to pay the price. It's a legal system that does not make one scrap of sense. Who are you paying the price to? One brother says that God had to pay Satan. Well, that makes as much sense as everything else. You know, everything in everything makes no sense. So that also, you can put that into the formula. But it only makes sense when you understand that we are dealing with natural consequences, not legal, not a legal system. The next thing is the broken curse. The broken curse. And as a matter of fact, let me just pause. And I, I, I have not been, another time I'm going to go through and just touch on the verses because I'm a little sensitive to the fact that I don't have enough time to do what I want to do. So I'm kind of leaving out the verses and just kind of quoting them. But let me just give you one verse here very quickly as we touch on the broken curse. Um, Galatians 3. Galatians 3, I think it's verse 10 or 11. Verse 13, actually. It says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree now i'm not going to um i'm not going to go into that this morning by any means but of all the things that god ever taught me i consider this this teaching about the broken curse to be one of the most wonderful it's special to me I mean, I appreciate the two Adams, I appreciate the, the two covenants, everything, but this broken curse. I battered my brain for days trying to understand why did Jesus have to die? Because one thing about my, my religious experience, it has to make sense. It has to make sense. Don't tell me that God killed Jesus so that he could find a way to forgive me. That doesn't make sense. It has to make sense. And I, I, I remember... Every morning I got up to pray, I was battering my mind. And it's, it's a strange thing because I would feel like my mind got to the very edge of a precipice where the answer was at my fingertips and I just could not step over that edge. My mind would pull back and I can't get it. I can't get it. And I remember the morning when it broke into my mind. What really happened? I took Paul's statement and I broke it down. The curse of the law. There's a curse associated with the law. I went back and I looked for that in the Bible. He was made a curse for us. What is a curse? 
And how is it associated with the law? And everything began to come together till I saw the picture. And I was, it blew my mind. I counted one of those special things that God really showed to me. And um, if you don't understand why I'm so enthused about it, I, I, would, I would encourage you, if you have not read the book, The Good News is Better Than You Think, go to that book and look at the chapter, The Broken Curse. There are three chapters together, why the sinner had to die, why Jesus had to die, and then the broken curse. And those thoughts will present a, a different perspective on why Jesus had to die. And to my mind, this is, this, this is something that God has given to us. And I don't think it exists anywhere else in the Christian world. Maybe I'm wrong, okay? But I've never seen it. And I've been a Christian for 40 something years, read books, all kinds of books, all kinds of ideas. And I really believe that, you know, God is helping us to understand the vital elements of truth for this end of time. It's hard to say that without trying to um, indeed. indeed. It's hard to say things like this without 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 it seeming like you know we're trying to elevate ourselves. It's hard, and I, I don't mean to do this, and you know I don't, right? But I, I, I am rejoicing because I appreciate what God has done and how He's doing it, and I appreciate the fact that we are a part of what He's doing. So forgive me for my little enthused and happy and focused on how we are being led the next thing is the two covenants now it's almost like in the one god movement our ministry and revelation 14 12 are the only ministries which have a let me see a proper understanding of the two covenants. I don't know of any other ministry. Now, granted, well, well, let me let me take that back. Let me take that back. I mean, in the English-speaking countries, right? I know that in Europe, Montenegro, Croatia, Serbia, Germany, Hungary, um, Romania, Africa, some places you do have ministries that are really running with these messages these truths, but I, I'm really I'm really re referring to those among the English speaking um, countries and those that are probably the more popular ministries. You know, you, you have Smyrna, you have Pioneer Health and Missions, you have Restitution Ministries, um, you have Revelation 14, 12, and you have Open Face Fellowship, maybe one or two smaller ones that I don't know much about, but I, I, I keep in touch with what they teach. And most of these ministries are completely opposed to our understanding of the, the two covenants. What is interesting is that among many non-Adventist ministries, there are people who kind of lean to our understanding. So it, it's a confusing religious scenario. But can anybody really understand the two covenants if you don't understand Christ in you? Is that possible? And can you really understand Christ in you if you believe in the Trinity? Mm -hmm. And can you believe in the two Adams if you don't believe Christ lives in you? You can't. You believe in the legal thing, like Adam was legally our father, so Adam sinned and God gave us the blame, and then Jesus lived righteously and God gave us the credit. That's not what we believe about the two Adams. We believe Adam sinned and he passed it on to us by inheritance. Jesus lived righteously and he gives us the righteous life by inheritance. Not a legal transaction, but a literal transference of life. You cannot believe this if you don't believe, if, if you believe in the Trinity. Because in, 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 in Adam's gift, of the unrighteous life. How did you inherit it? You inherited it because you were born from Adam's race. That's how you inherited it. You weren't born and then God put it on you. No. You weren't born and somebody imposed legal, legal, a legal sentence on you. No. You received it by being born, like a disease that is passed from parent to child. 
It's the same thing on the other side. Jesus lived righteously and became our everlasting father. He ascended up on high and gave gifts to men. He ascended on high that he might fill the whole universe. And so he passes on his life to you. That's how you become righteous. That's how you possess. That's how you escape the condemnation of Adam's life. That's how you become a, a son or a daughter of God by the inheritance of life. Not by a third person who was never one of us, who was never born among us, who could never be our father. So if you believe in the Trinity, you cannot understand the truth of the two Adams. You cannot understand the two covenants because the two covenants, the old covenant was the law written outside. The new covenant is the life on the inside. So praises be to our God. The next thing, of course, is related. And that is the kingdom of God. All right. What is the kingdom of God? All of these are related. But Jesus said that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations before the end comes. So Jesus himself said that the message to be preached to the world is the gospel of the kingdom. So nobody tell me that this, this gospel of the kingdom is not most important. And what is the most important thing? Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the truth of the kingdom of God. Same thing as the two Adams. Same thing as the new covenant. Impossible to understand until you understand the, 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 the truth of what is a spirit. Impossible to understand unless you understand the truth about God. Everything fits together like the links of a chain. In the theology of, of the majority of the Christian world, there are missing links. Their chain cannot hold together. It doesn't make sense. And what is 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 of great concern is that because in the one God movement, my goodness, the only thing they seem to understand is that there really is not a trinity. They understand the mechanics of the identity of God. But after that, everything falls away. They can't put their the, the elements of the truth together in a logical way. And, and they end up condemning people like us. Because we don't believe in the illogical uh, conglomeration of ideas that they throw together. It has to make sense. It has to fit together. God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of peace. God is not a God who is mixed up with, a, with, with one, one little square piece here and a round piece here and a disjointed piece here. No, everything fits together to make a beautiful pattern, a system that is complete. I praise God and I rejoice because I see this is how he's leading us. I myself have made this made this my 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 principle. If it doesn't make sense. And if it distorts the character of God, you can show me in black and white. All I will tell you is I'm going to examine this some more because I'm sure you're wrong. If it doesn't make sense. And if it does not stand in line with the truth of the God of love and justice and mercy and wisdom and goodness, take your doctrine somewhere else. When we understand it properly, we are going to see that we are, you, you are wrong and you are misrepresenting or misunderstanding the scripture. Because like I said, the key of knowledge is the knowledge of the goodness of God. That's the key of knowledge. And when you have that, you can open any door in the scriptures. And come up with a proper understanding. The last thing, of course, well, I won't even bother to go to the next screen because I, we already touched on it. The last element, point number nine, is the character of God. And of course, this is related to everything that we looked at before. But I consider these nine points of the utmost importance. And I consider that anybody, any ministry who hopes which hopes to be a part of God's, God's movement in the end of time. You have got to get these nine elements right. Maybe I missed out on something important. And I know that some of the things I say, they overlapped with each other. But at the same time, I believe that these nine that I mentioned cover what I consider to be the most vital elements of the gospel. Prophecy is important. 
and there might be other things that come in. People are going to talk about the state of the dead and all the rest of it, the Sabbath and so on. But these are, to me, they are peripherals. We, we have been accustomed to re a religious system where people make a mountain out of molehills. They major on minor things. But these nine things that I mentioned, these are the great elements of the good news. And when a Christian embraces these things, I believe that the rest of it will fall into place easily. When you are born again and you are in Christ and you are a part of the kingdom of God, you mean to say any false doctrine, minor false doctrine is going to take root in your mind and stay there? Impossible. When God becomes all in all, all God has to say is, look at this, and instantly you accept. Nothing stands in your way because Christ has become all in all. So, each of these deserves a sermon by itself. But I wanted to touch on it this morning and just give us the bare elements so we could consider these nine points. And I'm going to stop here.